Yes. Mr. Canavan, I want to turn to ask you about your involvement in the HIV haemophilia litigation. Um, in broad terms, how would you describe your role in relation to that litigation? I think uh, making policy input where required and dealing with the publicity and the parliamentary interest in the ongoing litigation and overseeing the work of my section in relation to discovery of documents. We'll come on to the issue of discovery um, shortly. Um, but before we do, can I just um, ask you to help us in understanding the role of some others whose names appear on the document? So Mr. Powell was one of the solicitors dealing with the litigation, is that right? He was a departmental solicitor, yes. Um, and then what was your understanding of Dr. Raymond's role in relation to the litigation? He input advice where medical advice was necessary and did a lot of work on identifying um, expert witnesses because, again, that was an issue of did they have the requisite medical background to do the, the job. Uh, and then what about Mr. Dobson? He was my boss. He tended to come in when matters progressed to the later stages and became more politically sensitive. Um, and, and then finally, Mr. Burridge, um, who was he and what was his role? He was one of my staff and he managed the actual process of going through the files to discover relevant documents. Um, you, I think, attended some conferences with council and some hearings, is, is that right? I didn't attend any hearings. I did attend some conferences with uh, council. Um, now, can I just ask you again, just looking at matters at a fairly general level, to look at a couple of documents. The first is MHRA 0017673. So we'll see this is at an early stage, 16th of March 1989. Uh, it's your minutes to Mr. Dobson and Mr. Hart, copied to Mr. Powell and Dr. Raymond. Um, it refers to uh, the litigation in the heading, and then it says, following your minute of the 7th of March to Mr. Harris, you'll have received a copy of Sol C3's paper setting out the pros and cons of orchestrating the defense in this litigation and suggesting where the balance of advantage lies. And then you say this, the department's information about the cases is very sketchy at present. Therefore, it's not really possible to say what the lines of defence will be or to assess its strength. Now, I'm just referring to that just to understand that as at March 1989, uh, when the litigation is in its early stages, um, uh, w would it be right to say that, that, from your perspective at least, there was not a clear idea or understanding of uh, either what the allegations were going to be or uh, how good any, any defence might be. That's right. We hadn't received um, the statement of claim, nor had we really started examining the department's files to assess how we would answer the various um, criticisms. Now, if we move on into June of 1989 um, to DHSC 0004776 underscore 039. Now, this is a minute from Mr. Dobson, um, who, as you've described, you, you reported to, um, to Mr. Heppel um, and to Mrs. Kirk, uh, who is in the private office of the Parliamentary uh, Under Secretary of State for Health, 
It's dated the 15th of June 1989, and we can see there's a long list of, of uh, recipients coppered into it, and, and we see your name right at the bottom of that list. Uh, yes. If, if we can then just go to the bottom of the page, we can see the purpose of the submission um, to inform ministers of the legal action being taken, at, and then uh, point two, to seek ministers' views on the case for resisting the plaintiff's attempt to proceed by way of a group action, to seek ministers' views on other options for handling the litigation and the controversy which it's likely to engender. Now, if we go over the page, there's a heading background. I I'm not going to um, read through that, but it refers there to um, the introduction of heat treatment um, and the introduction of screening. Um, if, if we turn to the next page, paragraph four, So if we can just zoom in on that top paragraph, thank you. I just want to pick it up just over halfway down that paragraph. We believe that the government has a fair chance of successfully defending its role and that of HAs, which I assume is health authorities, in the court actions. Given that at every stage, it has acted as swiftly as possible to minimize the risk of infecting haemophiliacs with AIDS in the light of the best expert opinion available at the time. Now, Mr. Canavan, that, that, that's a, that sentence contains a positive assertion of what the government has done and a positive assertion about the quality of expert opinion available to it. Would you agree that for, for that, that kind of assertion to be made to ministers, civil servants should have a proper factual basis for being able to say that in, in those terms? Yes. Do, do you know what inquiries or investigations or, or fact-finding had been undertaken um, by mid-June 1989 um, to enable Mr. Dobson to, Dobson to make that confident assertion? Well, uh, uh, probably by then he would have had a chance to read <coughs> background papers and his submission was probably passed around uh, a number of colleagues before it went up. But had you been in colleagues and administrative colleagues? As far as you can recall, had you at this stage, so we're talking in the sort of first few months, the first half of 1989, had you been involved yourself in any in examination of the department's past actions, the government's actions, the advice available to it? I cannot really recall that I had had, um, but there was a, a chance that I might have been uh, looking at what were the issues that uh, needed to be addressed. Um, and then if we can just turn to page five of this document. Paragraph 10 is headed publicity, and, and Mr. Dobson says this. There is a danger that the government will appear to be on the defensive over this issue if it merely waits for the court actions to proceed. See the attached cuttings from the Daily Express of 30th of May as an example of the likely press reaction. There might be a case for deliberately seeking some publicity to convey the message that the government has already acted to help haemophiliacs by setting up the McFarlane Trust, believes that it has consistently taken all possible steps to protect haemophiliacs in the light of current expert advice, uh, but welcomes the opportunity to test this belief in the courts. Now, that's a matter Mr. Dobson's raising for ministers to take a decision on, but do, do you, um, d did you have any view on that at the time, to, to, to the best of your recollection, this idea of, of, of positive publicity, of putting a positive spin on, on, on these events? No, I think that would have been an issue for the ministers to decide which way they wanted to play it. Uh, given that the the campaign would be both political as well as the litigation. Um, can, can I then ask you to look at DHSC 306275 underscore 030. Um, this is a minute from you um, dated the 10th of August 1989 to Jane Wheeler in FA2 
Um, the first paragraph refers to some preliminary hearings and having now received the statement of claim. And then this is said, it's clearly going to be alleged that funding of the CBLA and of the 13 regional transfusion centres was material in determining the date by which self-sufficiency in factor eight could have been achieved. They are asserting that self-sufficiency in blood products would have mitigated the effects of HIV transmission through factor eight. Investment in RTCs will be material if they seek to establish that more plasmapheresis centres could slash should have been built to increase plasma collection. We are searching our files for details of funding, but would be grateful if you could also verify investment figures from your records. Um, and then there's a reference in the next paragraph to this material might be being called for under the rules for discovery. Yeah. And then you say mm -hmm. any positive comments we might make would also, of course, be welcome. I would be happy to discuss. Um, just that last paragraph, the invitation to, to give positive comments, um, you add an exclamation mark, it might have been a light-hearted comment, but uh, what about negative comments? Were, were those not also equally important for the department to receive? They would have been, but I, I, I think you might be right in the sense that uh, it was a fairly uh, light-hearted comment. Um, and I think if she had produced details of funding, that could or could not have been both positive or, or negative. And it would have been obvious from the, fi the figures alone whether um, the investment was made at the time when it was requested. And, and to what extent were you able to put together a picture of, of, of what had happened in relation to funding? From memory, not a lot. Um, I think in a subsequent minute from Jane Wheeler, she commented that the PES bid documents had in the main been destroyed. And this, of course, all related back to um, the 70s. Uh, the 70s. So it was... Um, not unexpected that maybe some, at least some of the files would have been destroyed. Um, look, can I ask you to look also from August 1989 at, at the document at MHRA 0017687, please? This is a note attaching a briefing. It's from Dr. Raymond. Um, and it's the 23rd of August, 1989. Uh, you're one of a number of uh, those uh, listed as uh, having the minute copied to them. And we can see it says, I enclose a briefing for CMO for his meeting with MSH on the 30th of August, 1989, regarding HIV haemophilia litigation. Those present at the meeting with MSH will include, and, and then um, you are one of uh, five uh, listed as, as going to be present. Now, I'm, I'm not going to ask you about this specific briefing or document, but. Do, do you have any recollection of the attitudes of ministers to the HIV litigation, either at this point in time, 1989, or, or, or at any later stage of the litigation? No, no, I don't. Um, as things unfolded, uh, the chances are that uh, Mr Dobson would have been the attending meeting rather than me. I want to turn now to the specific issue of discovery or di disclosure of documents. Um, I want to pick it up with a, a handwritten minute from you to Mr. Powell, 19th of July, 1989. It's at DHSC 0006481 underscore 030. So you'll, you'll see the date there at the top of the page, Mr. Canavan, and we see um, that it, it's from you to Mr. Powell. Um, if we go to yep. the second page, um, there's a heading discovery of documents, and I'm just going to read um, what's set out here, if I may. Um, if there's any point at which I misread your handwriting, Mr. Canavan, please correct me. Um, uh, but it, it's much more legible than a lot of the handwriting we've looked at before. It was agreed on 4th of July that we would follow precedent and not disclose documents voluntarily. 
However, we would cooperate fully once a court order has been made. Certainly, would wish, we would wish to do the discovery only once, as it will be a very time-consuming exercise. When it is done, um, so when it is done is, as you say, of less concern. Our concern is that sufficient time should be allowed for the very considerable amount of work involved. Work is already underway to identify and list relevant documents. However, you are correct in saying that it will not be completed by the 24th of July, and by then we will only be able to give an indication of the scale of the problem. Um, as regards, and then I'm not sure what the next um, word is, Hansford? I, the name is Hansford. And what does that refer to? It was an, an individual case that was coming forward. Okay. Medicines Division are considering what documents, if any, they would wish to withhold. Um, for my own viewpoint, the advice to ministers is something we would certainly wish to um, withhold if this were possible under public interest immunity. Uh, for the others, I would like to reserve judgment until I, on top of the next page, know the scope of public interest immunity. There would be no point in trying to withhold items which would, could not be covered by that immunity. I think you were going to advise us on this question. I, I will come back by Friday with a response to your minute of the 17th of July. Um, then there's a section headed chronology of events leading to heat treatment uh, of factor eight. You asked if a separate chronology could be prepared on this. We will do what we can, but we think our files will have an incomplete record. And then there's a suggestion that the CBLA will be best placed to give um, a fuller picture. Um, I think that's probably all I need to refer to for present purposes. So, um, um, Mr. Canavan, just in terms of the disclosure exercise or discovery exercise, as, as it was then called, um, it would appear that by the date of this uh, minute, 19th of July 1989, work had begun on, on trying to gather documents together, but it was still really at a, a very early stage. Is, is that a correct understanding of what you were saying here? I think uh, we were better sighted on the scale of the uh, of the exercise and no doubt had made a start to it, yes. So you knew it was going to be time consuming, you knew it was going to be uh, um, take, a, take a period of time, you knew the issue of public interest immunity um, would need to be considered, but you hadn't yet um, uh, got and listed or analysed the documentation. Is, is, is that a fair summary? That's a fair summary, yes. It's certainly not a comprehensive account of all the documents to be held. Now, um, what, if any, advice or, or instructions or guidance did you or your colleagues receive about identifying relevant documents? Specifically on relevant documents or PII documents? On relevant documents. I don't think we received any specific guidance on that and probably uh, most of it would have been self-evident if they were relevant to the issues. So that was a judgment that you felt that you and your colleagues were able to make? I think so, yes. We can take the document down, thank you. Um, and is it right to understand from your statement that the task of of gathering together documents uh, for the purposes of, of discovery um, was largely undertaken by Mr. Burridge. That's right, and his uh, staff, which were part of my staff, yeah. Um, and, and was the task that, that you and he and other colleagues um, were, were undertaking uh, for the purposes of the litigation looking at or looking for documents across the whole of the Department of Health? No, we would have asked other branches that may have papers to look for their own. So you would, we would be have been looking at the ones relevant to our policy section. Um, it, it, now, we know in due course lists were drawn up and then issues arose in relation to public interest immunity being claimed in respect of some of those documents. 
Um, in, in terms of the, if we leave aside public interest immunity now, in, in terms of drawing up the list of, of, of relevant documents, was that done by, by, by you and Mr. Burridge? Or, or, or was that by left Mr. to the solicitors? Burridge, yes, yeah, by Mr. Burridge. With now, assistance was necessary, yeah. Now, if we just turn then, bearing in mind that's July 1989, if we turn to these two, DHSC 00. 46948 underscore 005. This is a minute from you uh, to Mr. Powell. It's dated the 31st of January 1990. So we're approximately six months or so further on. Um, and you say this, I enclose a list of documents we've identified so far for this litigation. We have still to extract from it items which seem irrelevant, and we also wish to play around and tidy it up a bit. We're still working on the separate list of ministerial papers which would be listed for the plaintiffs, but for which we would uh, wish to claim public interest immunity from disclosure. Uh, and then you, you ask Mr. Powell if he's got any comments on the list. And then if we go to the next paragraph, it says this, as you know, we have not scrutinized many of the documents which are listed. Uh, you were to advise on whether we could put the list forward and subsequently claim PII, or, or whether we had to put in a protective claim for all the documents um, at this stage, uh, and so on. And then if we look at the last paragraph, you say, I would stress that our listings are what we've been able to do so far and as you know, some of our efforts were wasted as they took us beyond the June 1986 date. Now, again, if we leave aside for the moment, please, the question of public interest immunity, is it right to understand from this that by, by January 1990, end of January, you, with the assistance, or Mr Burridge, perhaps, perhaps with, with, with others, um, you put together a list of documents based upon your Re reviews or searches of the files but it would appear you haven't actually been looking at the documents in detail the content of the documents um, yourselves is that right not in detail it would have been initial scrutiny to see if they were relevant and as far as you can recall was there ever a point in in the litigation which of course we know at a later stage settled and never went to court was there ever a point at which you or policy colleagues sat down and, and read through the detail of the documents to pull together a, a clear understanding of, of what um, actions and decisions had been taken i think that would have been um, done at a later stage um, i cannot recall when um, and of course, our solicitors would have had um, access to the, the files and presumably in preparation for their instructions to counsel. So is it right to understand from your answer, Mr. Canavan, that as, as far as you can recall, you yourself didn't read through the, the, the contents of the documents other than for the purpose of identifying potential relevance or identifying if it was a category of document for PII? Well, no, I mean, I think beyond that, if David Burridge had any concerns about um, whether it was relevant, whether it might be subject to PII, um, he would come and ask for my advice. And at that point, I would have read the document. And do, do you have any recollection of, of the extent to which that happened? No, I couldn't quantify it, no. Um, now, I've, I've not um, uh, 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 focused on what's said in these various documents in relation to, to PII. Um, as I understand your statement, Mr. Canavan, um, and the contemporaneous documents, in terms of PII, is it right to understand that you relied on the advice that uh, you were being given uh, by solicitors and counsel about the categories of documents over which PII could be claimed? Yes. And so w was, was your task essentially one of categorisation to see if a document 
fell within one of the identified categories? Judging whether or not they fell within that category, that's right. Um, can we then just look in relation to documents still at um, DHSC 0043223. Um, now, this is now May 1990. This is the note of a conference on the 18th of May 1990. And we can see those in attendance. So um, Andrew Collins is the um, leading counsel with, um, instructed by the department. Uh, Mr. Desai's solicitor's office, Justin Fennett, from whom the inquiry is heard, is also in the council team. Um, Mr. Powell, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Mr. Powell's solicitor, Dr. Raymond. Um, do you know who Christine Bendel was? She, from memory, she was a solicitor in the department as well. And then you're in attendance, and then Peter Brand, who, as I understand it, was also a solicitor uh, in, in the yeah. department. Um, now, the inquiries looked at this document before, um, uh, and you have dealt with it in your witness statement, but I just want to explore with you whether there's any further light you can shed on it. Um, it says, Council Mr Andrew Collins opened the conference by saying that we've not yet sorted out the documents on public interest immunity. We must stop destruction on the date the litigation comes on. Hepatitis, virtually nothing. Most of it uh, has already um, been destructed. And then there's a description of what might or might not um, uh, qualify for PII, which I'm, I'm not proposing to read through. Um, are, are you able to assist us with understanding what's meant by the statement we must stop destruction on the date the litigation comes on. Do, do you have any recollection of, 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 of how the I discussion... I have no recollection of that conference whatsoever, I know. Um, and then in relation to hepatitis, virtually nothing, most of it has already been destructed. Um, I, I think you say in your statement, although you've no recollection of this meeting, that, as I understand it, does accord with your recollection that there were comparatively few documents relating to hepatitis because they had been destroyed. That's right, because they related to some time back. Um, if we just go over the page, the um, initials are PGB, which is presumably a reference to, to Mr. Brand. Um, would you have expected a solicitor's note of a conference with counsel to have been sent to, to you and Mr. Raymond, um, effectively as the, 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 those dealing with the litigation at the time? Normally, whoever prepares a minute circulates it to those in attendance, yes. Do, um, do you know whether you saw this document at the time? I cannot recall whether I saw it at that time, no. It was included in one of the set of documents I've been looking at. Um, <coughs> can we then just turn to um, no, sorry, I've got the wrong reference there. Um, can we turn to DHSC 0012688, I think. Um, so this is a note um, of a conversation with you. Um, it's not entirely clear who has um, authored this. It may have been Mr. Powell. Um, but in any event, leaving that aside, it says, I spoke to John Canavan on the phone concerning his minute of the 3rd of January 1990. Um, then there's an um, issue relating to the Northwest Thames Regional Health Authority, which I don't need to invite you to look at. If we go to the bottom of the page, it says this. In the last paragraph, we decided in the short run that no admissions could be made. The line to be taken as regards Mr. Kenny was that as the documents still at present, we could not accept that it was our liability. 
There is no reason, however, why we should not try to find more information about what was going on at the relevant time from the people who were actually there. A Mr. Armour, who was one of the managers at BPL, was seconded there from North West Thames, and also very much involved was a former Deputy Chief Medical Officer of ours, Ms. Dr. Harris. We should suggest to Mr. Kenny that he should obtain information from Mr. Armour as to what was going on at the relevant time. I said that if somebody in the department could find Dr. Harris's current address, we could go and see him and obtain a statement. And then if we go over the next to the next page, um, there's then some discussion about Northwest Thames Regional Health Authority again. Uh, and then the last paragraph says Mr. Canavan agreed he would speak to Mr. O'Gorman, who was seeing Mr. Kenny tomorrow, and suggest that there was no reason why Mr. Kenny could not go and see Mr. Canavan at the same time to discuss matters further. Um, now, f first of all, um, Mr. Canavan, do you have any recollection of this discussion? No. Um, obviously, I've seen the documents, but uh, I don't recall any discussions I had with uh, Mr. Powell, if he was the author of the note, nor of Ms. with Mr. Kenny. Um, in, in any event, what this appears to be suggesting is that there should be some factual inquiries made to get more information about what was going on at BPL at the relevant time. And there's a suggestion of seeking information from Mr. Armour and from Dr. Harris. Um, do you know whether either of those steps were taken? Um, I simply don't recall. Um, and then if we turn uh, to DHSC 0044876, so this is the same month, January 1990. Um, it's from um, Dr. Raymond to you, um, and it's telling, it's providing you with information about a conference with council that had taken place the previous day. Um, we can see from the list of those in attendance that you were not at that particular conference. Um, I just wanted to, to um, refer you to one passage on page five. Um, it's towards the top of the page, the paragraph beginning Dr. Raymond to furnish a summary list of expert witnesses. So, so Dr. Raymond to furnish a summary list of expert witnesses for the central defendants to Mr. R. Powell. Witnesses as to fact should also be considered. Um, and then there's a reference to um, how, how um, Mr. Fenwick um, wanted expert witness reports to be prepared. Um, now, as I understand it from your statement and, and indeed the documents, and your answer a few minutes ago, the, the task of finding potential expert witnesses um, was left to Dr. Raymond. Um, mm -hmm. But in relation to witnesses of fact, it would appear from this that perhaps by January 1990, statements from witnesses of fact had not yet been taken. Did you have any involvement with the process of approaching possible factual witnesses and, and getting information from them? No, I wasn't involved in that, as far as I recall. Um, may have been somebody on my section. Um, <coughs> can I then ask you to look at a, a document at MHRA 0017634, please? Um, again... It's not clear um, uh, whether this is from Mr. Powell or uh, somebody else entirely. It's dated the 26th of January, 1990. Um, and it says, I attended a meeting with Dr. Raymond, Mr. Canavan and Mr. Brand, which we discussed who might be approached to give evidence on the department's behalf. Uh, and then there are a number of possible witnesses there listed. Um, there's a reference to um, uh, someone in the CMO's office, to Alan Barton in the AIDS unit. Um, in relation to HS1A, there's a reference to an Alan Williams, reference to Mike Arthur, a, another reference there to Malcolm Harris, um, uh, and then to Stan Godfrey. And then if we go further down the page, there's a reference there to Dr. Pickles uh, and to Margaret Smith over the page. It says, the role of prevention generally see John Middleton, CMP1. The general scheme is that the department tends to be reactive at passing on information where necessary. 
Do you know what CMP1 was? Sorry, I don't. Um... Um, and then there are a number of other uh, inquiries that are discussed as to um, what, what might need to be uh, looked for. A little further down, there's then a reference to Dr. Wolford, Diana Wolford and Alison Smithers. Um, uh, and um, uh, that there's an, another, um, I think, name towards the bottom of the page. So it, this would appear to be a meeting, the purpose of which was to identify certain factual lines of inquiry and certain witnesses of fact who, who might be approached to, to give accounts of, of their knowledge and involvement. Um, yes. D d did you then have any role um, in approaching any of these witnesses or undertaking any of these lines of inquiry, as far as you can recall? No, I can't recall. Um, from the names that I mentioned, Mike Arthur was the only one that um, uh, was in my time, so to speak, on the blood seat. And the others had disappeared from that scene. Um, uh, and just to complete the picture in terms of factual witnesses, if we go to DHSC 0014940 underscore 006, Um, this is the note of an office meeting, 20th of November. Um, it doesn't give the year, but it's apparent that it must be 1990 from um, what's set out later in the document. Bottom of the page, there's a reference to expert witnesses. But then if we go over the page, um, item six, witnesses to fact. It says Mr. Powell will be interviewing witnesses as to fact. And work on this item is to start shortly. Mr. Powell agreed to circulate a list of witnesses as to fact he intends to approach with their whereabouts. Um, so it, this would appear to suggest that the, that the um, task of ob obtaining, um, uh, interviewing witnesses and obtaining statements of, of fact had not commenced as at November 1990. Uh, did you ever see any... Um, draft witness statements or notes of any interviews that Mr. Powell had, had carried out with, with any such witnesses? I did not, no. Um, now, in, in terms of approaching expert witnesses, um, you've indicated um, that that was uh, something Dr. Raymond was dealing with. Can I just ask you to look at one document on that issue? It's DHSC 0040903 So this is from you to Dr. Raymond, 15th of August 1989. Expert witnesses for HIV AIDS litigation, and I think we only need to look at paragraph one. In a discussion Mr. Arthur had with Mr. Powell before his annual leave, Sol C3 asked again for names of expert witnesses for the defendants. We advised the difficult, if not impossible, task of finding a haemophilia centre director untouched by the litigation and who could give independent testimony supportive of the defendant's case. Um, now, can I just ask first of all about that last phrase, supportive of the defendant's case. Was was it your approach or the department's approach that what you wanted was expert evidence supporting the department's case, as opposed to warts and all expert evidence which might criticise the department's position? I think we were expecting that some of the experts would have critical comments to make. Um, I think uh, that could be read more that Obviously, if somebody had been publicly critical of the department's case, that might not be the best person to approach. But no, we weren't out to um, get only some testimony which was supportive. And in fact, from what I saw of the expert witnesses, some of them were um, critical of the department. And that was at a fairly late stage when their um, evidence was being prepared. Now, I, so we did set out to be selective. 
Now, I think the department got an expert report from Dr. Elizabeth Main, who was the Haemophilia Centre Director in Belfast. There was also an expert report from Professor Bloom, I think strictly commissioned by one of the other um, sets of defendants rather than the department. Um, other names um, mooted as, as experts in, included Dr. Ludlam, the Haemophilia Centre Director in Edinburgh. Um, you, you touch here upon the concern that it, uh, it, it might be difficult, if not impossible, to find someone untouched by the litigation. Um, to what extent did you or your colleagues think that any reliance could be placed upon the advice you might receive from haemophilia centre directors, bearing in mind their own direct involvement in the issues under examination? I think they were approaching them even would have placed them in a difficult position if they were having to defend their own actions or in a way that would have compromised their um, patient relationship with the haemophiliacs. So it was more about um, that than regarding their evidence as somehow being unworthy. The, um, the various reports were obtained, and, and we know from other documents, um, some at least of which I know you've, you've, you've looked at for your statement, that Dr. Raymond um, read the reports as they came in, and uh, he would circulate minutes with some reflections um, or, or observations on the reports. Do you recall whether you yourself read the expert reports? I think I read them, but probably didn't comment beyond what Dr. Raymond had said because it was really going into the realm of um, the medical aspects of the case. Um, now, I'm going to move now to a different aspect of the litigation. Um, um, and it's the, the steps taken by the department on receipt of a communication from the judge Mr. Justice Ognall, um, and just as a, 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 um, a to provide the foundation for the questions, if we go to DHSC 0046964 underscore 024, um, this was the note from Mr. Justice Ognall, 26th of June 1990. Um, uh, uh, in which he, uh, as we see from the second paragraph, invited the parties to give anxious consideration to the prospects of any compromise uh, of um, these uh, proceedings. Um, uh, and um, he talked about, uh, uh, if we go over the page, um, in the second paragraph, the plight of the plaintiffs, describing it as a, as a special one, um, <coughs> and observing um, uh, their suffering and also their entire blamelessness. Uh, and, and then if we go to the next page. We can see, he, picking it up in the third line, he says, it might be said I've raised considerations of a political rather than a purely legal character. I acknowledge that, but I believe the legal profession has a duty to do its best to see that the legal system does not become a scapegoat in the eyes of the public for what I fear may be perceived as the unjust and inhumane denial of any significant measure of compensation um, to the plaintiffs. So it, it may be said he was making a, a moral case, a case based upon a humane course um, for there to be uh, the payment of a significant measure of compensation to the plaintiffs. I, I think from your statement, you, you don't recall you yourself having any particular view on the action taken by Mr. Justice Ognall. But do, do you have any recollection of what the departmental view or feeling was um, about this intervention? No, I think we moved on very quickly to... Um, trying to take ministers' mind on what 
there might or might not want to do as a result of it, rather than taking any um, view on the fact that the judge had said this. <coughs> I, I want then to come to the process of, of, of settlement of the litigation now, so we can take that down. Uh, the inquiry's heard uh, uh, quite a lot of evidence about this process, so I, I, I'm not going to go through the, the, the detailed um, chronological um, description of the documents that set out in your statement. In, in terms of timing, a proposed compromise from the plaintiffs um, or, or from the steering committee uh, uh, representing um, uh, plaintiffs was received in November 1990. Um, and we don't need to look at it, but for the transcript, um, the reference is DHSC 00036541117. Um, can you recall what your involvement was in the weeks that followed um, the receipt of that proposal for compromise? No, I mean, I think from having looked at the documents, I may have authored one or two of the submissions, but um, I think that would have been a result of consultation all around the houses, um, and uh, rather than me taking a personal view on assessing the, uh, the proposal from the plaintiffs. Um, I think that there's certainly some evidence that you, you circulated or contributed to the circulation and preparation of a background note on the 6th of November. We've looked at it with other witnesses, so I'm just going to give the reference. It's DHSC 00004365 underscore 008. Um, there is one document I wanted to ask you about, Mr. Canavan, um, which is at DHSC... 0046962 underscore 028. So this is the 12th of November 1990. From you to Mr. Dobson um, and Mr. Alcock. Um, uh, and we can see in the first sentence it says, in his minute of the 9th of November, Mr. Dobson promised further advice on the proposed scheme of compromise received from the plaintiffs. This note sets out our considered assessment of those provisions which present difficulty, uh, and for ease of reference, a copy of the provisions is annexed. <coughs> you then set out um, a number of observations, and the, and the first, I, I, I won't read the paragraph aloud, was about the cost and where um, the money would come from. Um, and then if we go over the page, there are comments on a number of other issues. Um, if we could just go to page three, please, and the, the heading conclusion and the paragraphs under that. Um, you say there, um, it seems to us there are two main sticking points. Um, the first is, is, is that a deal would end the litigation, um, and the second is um, how to dispose of the medical negligence cases. Um, and then in the final paragraph, you say this, finally, the overall cost proposed, £42 million, seems to us on the high side, given the hidden extras. Secretary of State may wish to take counsel's advice on how far it might be possible to negotiate this figure down while still offering a settlement which the vast majority of plaintiffs could accept. Um, what was the basis for saying that £42 million pounds, um, was on the high side? I think I was feeding off what uh, Strawn Heppel had put in his note and Mr Dobson in his preliminary note to ministers. Um, and I think it was high in the, because of the hidden extras. But uh, I have no basis for judging whether this looked like a high or a low figure for litigation of this kind. Um, if, if we then go to um, um, a, a question and answer briefing, um, which is at DHSC 3035111 underscore 039. Um, 
Um, so this is obviously has been prepared uh, in, in anticipation of a, a settlement being announced um, uh, and anticipating the questions that the uh, minister might uh, uh, receive. And the first is, is the government now admitting negligence? No. We do not believe that anyone, either in the Department of Health or in the NHS, was to blame for this tragedy. The advice given to government and the treatment given to patients was at all stages reasonable in the light of the knowledge available at the time. Um, now, my question, Mr. Canavan, um, uh, um, is what, what was the factual basis on which the department felt able to assert that the treatment given to patients was at all stages reasonable in light of the knowledge available at the time? I think that must have been an input from the medical side of the house. Um, and in terms of the advice given to government, to, to what extent had there been by this time, uh, and bearing in mind that we're in November 1990, as far as we can see, the, Mr. Powell hadn't yet taken the factual statements and the disclosure had taken place, but not necessarily scrutiny of all the documents. What, what was the factual basis upon which the department could say the advice it received was at all stages reasonable? Was that based on the expert reports or, or are you unable to say? I'm, I'm really unable to say. Um, and then in, in terms of the settlement, um, again, we've had a lot of evidence about the involvement of uh, ministers um, in, in the process, the announcements that were made and so on. Um, did you, from your perspective in, in HS1A, have any sense of whether the change in ministers from Mr. Clark to Mr. Waldegrave was significant in terms of um, a, a change of attitude to settlement of the litigation? Um, I couldn't honestly say whether that was the case, but I do <coughs> recollect that at one stage, um, Charles Dobson circulated a note saying that um, ministers were beginning to um, appear unsettled by the advice to dig in and fight the litigation. And if I remember right, that was about August 1990. Um, so maybe things were moving um, before there was ever a change of ministers. Um, now, you had some involvement once the um, there had been the in principle agreement to settle. You had some involvement in some aspects of the detailed working out of the terms of settlement. Um, and I think one of the areas in which you had some involvement was with the question of the social security provisions, the, the, the social security disregard. Um, I, I'm not going to, again, take you through the documents which you've set out in, in your statement. Do you have any recollection of whether um, there was any discussion of the social security disregard um, being offered on the basis that uh, plaintiffs would get it if they agreed to sign away their rights to bring any further litigation, uh, in particular in relation to hepatitis? Was there ever no, a quid pro quo? ever having been any linkage like that. Um, now, you, you're aware, I think, for, again, from the documents you've looked at for the purposes of your statement, um, of, of an issue about the plaintiffs um, signing an undertaking in, in which they agreed not to bring um, any future litigation, either in relation to HIV infection or hepatitis. Did you have, as far as you can recall, any involvement in, um, in that process, in the decision to have a, that as part of the terms of settlement? No. Um, and do you recall being present at any discussions within the department about that waiver and, and how, how it should be expressed? No. Do you know where it originated from or from whom it originated? 
having read um, Mr. Justin Fenwick's uh, evidence to the inquiry, um, I think his evidence suggested that it came forward from the plaintiffs. But, but in terms of your own knowledge from the documents at the time or your in terms own knowledge? Of my own knowledge, no. I don't know where it came from. Um, can I then um, ask you to look on a different topic at, um, but still related to the litigation, DHSC 0041034 underscore 038. This is the draft of a submission to ministers. Um, I, I think we have the, the final copy, but um, I, I don't. Um, the, the detailed content of it isn't, isn't material to, to the question I want to ask you. You'll see here it says, following previous discussions with ministers, the department and other central defendants in this action, Committee on the Safety of Medicines Licensing Authority Welsh Office, are presently acting on the policy that the plaintiff's claim should be put to the courts and that all allegations of negligence should be contested. Um, now, the question I want to ask you about is about the role of the Welsh office. Um, do you, did your team or, or did the department um, um, uh, liaise with the Welsh office during the litigation, um, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, all, all that I did was copy documents to them, but I don't remember receiving any... Um, feedback from them. Okay. So were, were you aware of the Welsh Office taking any active role um, in developing the litigation strategy? I wasn't aware of any such, no. Um, uh, uh, and then what about the position in, in Northern Ireland? Um, was there any um, discussion uh, with Northern Ireland as to uh, whether they had any, anything to say or offer or input into, into the, the, the approach or response to the litigation? No, um, they got copied in as a matter of routine, but I don't remember having any contact from them. Uh, and then in relation to Scotland, your statement um, s re refers to some um, correspondence um, with colleagues in the Scottish Home and Health Department, in particular in relation to um, um, matters relating to the, the, the terms of settlement. But more generally, um, um, to what extent were you or your colleagues involved in liaising with um, uh, 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 officials in Scotland earlier in the litigation? Um, I don't recall that uh, we did any um, or have it, had any involvement with them at the earlier stages. Um, with their own judicial system, no doubt they were doing a lot of the, um, the work for themselves rather than following DH. Uh, and would it be right to understand from that you didn't have any particular knowledge yourself about the nature of or the course of the litigation in Scotland? No, not until um, I think you would refer to that correspondence where... Uh, in drawing up the settlement, there were uh, some suggestions as to what might be done for Scotland that would depart to some extent from England. Um, and those, that's detailed um, in your witness statement. I'm not going to go to it, but it's from page 175 um, um, onwards of your statement. Um, Mr. Canavan, I want, want to turn to a, a, a slightly different um, and short topic now, and that's the McFarlane Trust. And I'm not talking here now about the, the, the vehicles that were used as the means for uh, payment of um, um, the monies from the litigation, but the, the main McFarlane Trust. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what was your role in relation to the McFarlane Trust as you understood it? Well, basically, I was the department's liaison with them. Uh, they would come to me, and if I had any queries about the trust, the original trust, I would go to, to them. So it was a liaison <coughs> role. 
Um, and, and what was your understanding more generally of the role of the department vis-a-vis -vis the McFarlane Trust and, and the relationship between the department and the trust? Well, we were funder and I think the department had the right to appoint some of the trustees. Um, but apart from that, I think they recognised that the trust was an independent trust with responsibilities and obligations placed on the trustees. I just want to ask you about a couple of documents from uh, September 1989 um, relating to a meeting with the McFarlane Trust that you were attending with Strawn Heppel. Uh, if we look first of all at DHSC 00003315 underscore 004, Um, uh, this is really just to give the date. It's from Mr. Arthur, 5th of September. It's to you and to Mr. Heppel, uh, meeting with the McFarlane Trust, 7th of September, 1989. Uh, and he says, I attach a background note covering the agenda items envisaged by the McFarlane Trust, uh, together with comments arising from the preliminary meeting with them on the 31st of August. Um, and then if we could go to the briefing itself, it's at DHSC 0003318 underscore 006. The background says this, the department has strictly observed the independent status of the McFarlane Trust since it was established on the 10th of March 1988. However, MSH has requested two monthly reports on the Trust's activities, and then reference is made to the most recent report. Paragraph two, the Trust seek this meeting to determine whether present activities are in line with government expectations, to seek approval for expansive variations to the Trust deed, to seek approval for a major escalation of financial help in areas they have so far treated with caution, e.g. loans for housing. And then if we go to the next paragraph, it says the trust will be looking for a general assurance that their grant allocation policy and investment policy are broadly on the right lines. Um, they feel vulnerable having received no communication from the department. And then I don't think we need to read the rest. Um, now, it, it might be said that there's a tension between the independent status of the McFarlane Trust um, and the Department of Health getting two monthly reports and being looked to to give approval that the Trust's policies and, and um, approach are in line with government expectations. Do, do you have any observations on that? Well, I, I think that um, the request for the two monthly reports was made because of the political pressure ministers were coming under about the trust acting very slowly in making payments at the outset. Um, I think that uh, beyond that, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to say on any basis of um, having seen anything, but I think we would have, if the independent trustees had a particular difficulty about doing anything um, that, that the department had requested, I'm sure they would have raised it <coughs> and then who knows, I don't ever recall it arising, but the department would have had to decide then where this tension could be resolved. Um, for the sake of completeness, I'm not going to go to it, but the note of the meeting on the 7th of September is at DHSC 00002952 underscore 009. Um, then I've just got a, a handful of uh, of final questions, um, Mr. Canavan, on a, a range of topics. Um, in relation to the first question, if we could look at DHSC 0002536 underscore 079, please. Uh, 
Um, this, um, I think, is the final version of a submission that we looked at um, uh, uh, earlier. Um, if, if for present purposes, and, sorry, it's dated October 1989, I should say. If for present purposes, we just look at page nine. You'll see there the heading option D, Commission of Inquiry. Um, and I, I should perhaps just to place this in context. Let me take you to page four, first of all, Mr. Canavan, just so you can see how this arose. So page four is other options for the future. If ministers are minded to review our current stance, possible options for dealing with this litigation and or increasing the financial help presently on offer to haemophiliacs are as follows. And then there's a range of options. And then if we go to page nine, Option D was Commission of Inquiry, um, and we can see um, it said an option mooted by an NHS Haemophilia Centre director attached to the Haemophilia Society was that a Commission of Inquiry might be established. Um, this could either assess the government's record over the relevant period or consider the case for an ex-gratia payment or both. Now, we, we know, of course, that that didn't happen, and th this um, particular inquiry is taking place many years after the event. But... Was there ever, um, as far as you can recall, any attempt within the department during your time to see whether lessons could be learnt um, arising out of the, the terrible tragedy that had befallen so many patients? No. I uh, don't recall any such consideration. Um... And then uh, the next topic is in relation to um, the destruction of certain files relating to the ACVSB. You deal with this in your witness statement, WITN 7115001, page 97 onwards. No, it's not page 97 onwards, I'm sorry. It's page 87 onwards. Um, no, you say at the top of the page, the inquiry asks me a series of questions related to destruction of ACVSB documents. I, I do not believe that I was aware of this issue prior to receipt of the inquiry's request for a statement. Now, I think it, 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 the answer to my next question is probably obvious from, um, from what you say there. Um, uh, I, I, is it right to understand that you were never contacted um, by anyone within the department to um, uh, try and help understand what had happened to the ACVSB files? No, I have no recollection of any contact after I had left the blood policy scene at all. Um, and, and you are, say it, it clearly in your statement that you, you yourself don't have any knowledge of what happened to, to these particular um, papers. Um, but if we just go to the next page. At paragraph 2.224, um, and you've been referred to some of the um, documentation and the initials JR, you say it's possible it denoted John Rutherford who worked under me from around early 1991. And I should just say, of course, we have a statement from Mr. Rutherford who has said the, the, that, that it's not his, um, his handwriting um, and he would, thinks he would have um, signed rather than simply given any initials if it was his decision. Um, is there anyone else that you um, can identify who those initials JR could belong to? Uh, in, in terms of consideration of ACVSB files and, and what should happen to them? No, I, uh, I don't remember anybody else with those initials being around at that time. Um, and then just two final questions, Mr Canavan. Um, if we go in your statement to page 211... Um, so, you'll see halfway down the page, there's a heading, um, Pannoni Napier passing discovery documents to J. Keith Park 
and co-solicitors' blood transfusion litigation. Um, and you've referred, and I'm, I'm, I'm not unless you need me to, Mr. Kahneman, I'm going to go to the underlying documents. Uh, but you're referred there to um, a, a letter uh, in which Pannoni Napier solicitors tell the department that they passed documents from the HIV litigation um, to J. Keith, Park, J. Keith Park and Co. solicitors for use in the blood transfusion litigation. Um, and then the next paragraph, bottom of the page, you refer to your response on the 23rd of October 1991, and the reference is there set out, DHSC 30 46 But if we just keep with the statement, please, Lawrence, and go to the next page. This is an, an extract from um, your response uh, the, in the italicised paragraph at the top of the page. I'm concerned that we should keep firm control over who has access to the haemophilia litigation documents as provided under the terms of the settlement. Otherwise, they may be given an ever-widening circulation and eventually some snippets could reach the media. It may be difficult to pinpoint the source, but in any case, taking action against that party may not undo the damage. Um, and then you say in the next paragraph this, I'm asked by the inquiry and so far as I can recall why I had such concerns. The documents which have been disclosed in the HIV litigation were so provided on the understanding that they would not be shared further or used for any other purpose. Many of the documents disclosed within the HIV litigation would be documents which did not reach the threshold for a claim of PII, but were nonetheless documents which would usually be withheld from public view. If snippets of this type, so if snippets of documents of this type became available to the media, there was a possibility of mischief making by the media or reputational damage, particularly if any such snippets were misunderstood or taken out of context. Um, and, and the question um, that I'm, I'm asked to put to you um, uh, or explore with you, Mr. Canavan, in relation to this um, part of your statement is, is this. Um, would it be usual for the department at this time to consider possible mischief making by the media or reputational damage to the department to be good reasons for um, withholding documents from public scrutiny? It would depend what documents we were talking about. Um, I don't think we can answer, or I could answer that without knowing what document they had in mind or was at risk of being put out into the public domain. Uh, can, can I then ask you perhaps a more general question? Um, to, to what extent during the time you were involved in, in, with the department in matters relating to blood policy, so 89 to 94, to what extent was there a culture of openness or transparency within the department? Well, I mean, I think that the um, press office were always briefed uh, when circumstances warranted. Um, ACVSB minutes were confidential. They were not um, sort of uh, circulated or put into the public domain as a matter of course. Um, so it was probably uh, some things yes, some things no would be put into the public domain. Uh, we can take that down, thank you. Uh, and then um, you, you refer there to the press office. As, as someone who from time to time was involved in, in drafting briefings um, or, or, or notes or information to be supplied to the press office, was it, was it generally understood that the press office should be given the most positive spin or most positive account of things uh, within a, in, in an effort to avoid what might otherwise be legitimate criticism? No, I mean, they had to be given the full background so that they would understand the context in which they might have been asked a question by um, a newspaper or some other media outlet. So they were put in the picture uh, they were put in the picture as to what had been going on and why. And then the final document I want to ask you about, Mr Canavan, um, before we break, is DHSC 0002472 underscore 085. Uh, 
Um, this is a minute from you to Dr. Metters, and um, it looks also as though it's to the CMO's private office, 14th of August, 1990. Um, uh, it refers to um, an invitation um, to speak at a conference. Uh, um, and a paragraph two says, we would advise against CMO or a deputy speaking at this conference. Self-sufficiency in blood products is a sensitive subject at present as the haemophiliacs with HIV are alleging negligence by the government for failing to achieve it quickly enough in this country. Even though the conference is particularly concerned with European self-sufficiency, there is a risk that remarks by UK spokesmen would be exploited for the purposes of the litigation. And then this sentence, the occasion could also present an opportunity for awkward questions about past performance in this country. Um, what, what were the kind of awkward questions about past performance that, that you, you had in mind or that you thought needed to be avoided? Uh, I think um, I was asked by Dr. Pickles to give this advice about the invitation to CMO. And I think she, in fact, in a handwritten uh, note, um, had uh, indicated what she thought was the appropriate line to take in going back to CMO. She was going on leave and didn't have time to deal with it. Okay. Um, and I think if we just, Lawrence, I hope you have this. Um, it's DHSC 0002472 underscore 087. Is, is this the handwritten note you're referring to? Is that the note I was referring to, yes. So it says, Mr. Canavan, since I'm about to go and leave, can I leave you to deal with this? In view of the litigation, it's very awkward. Uh, alternative speakers would be Metas or me. I suggest you put your draft through Dr. Metas on the way to CMO's office. So w were you taking your, your, your use of referring to awkward questions about past performance in this country? Um, you were taking the lead from... Um, from um, Dr. Pickles. Dr. Pickles, yes. <coughs> um, sir, um, I note the time, but also um, that's the end of the uh, areas I was proposing to explore with Mr. Canavan. Uh, so if we could take our afternoon break, and that can be the opportunity for legal representatives of core participants to suggest any further questions they would like me to consider. Uh, y yes, L let me just ask one question arising out of the, the draft, since it's on the screen at the moment. Um, the, the words, awkward questions about past performance in this country, uh, aren't, uh, I think, uh, are they uh, in handwriting by uh, Dr. Pickles on, on this, this note? Yes. So where do you think they came from? The ones in the advice which went to CMO. Uh, the, yes, you, the, the, uh, your letter, yeah, your memo. I think that was my interpretation of what she was getting at. What made you think that she might have the view uh, that there would be awkward questions about past performance in this country, particularly when the line hitherto seems to have been that the government had provided the, the best available treatment? Well, it was just my interpretation. What do you think gave rise to that interpretation? I think just knowledge of the litigation and the issues that had been raised in the litigation. Yes, thank you very much. Well, we'll take a, a, a break and then now. Uh, this break may be, may be slightly longer than the usual break, I don't know. It depends upon the number of questions there may be for you. Because at this stage uh, in the proceedings, that those people who are core participants and represented by legal representatives uh, have a right to put through those legal representatives to counsel for her to ask you uh, questions which have arisen out of the evidence you've given them. Plainly, the evidence you've given is just, just finished. And so they haven't had an opportunity necessarily to formulate those questions beforehand. So they must be given that chance. That may take a little while. It, it may be that it doesn't take long. 
but we won't know till later. So what I propose is that we do not come back before 10 to 4. It might be a little later, so not before 10 to 4. Thank you, sir. Uh, if, the, if it's further delayed, you'll be told. Yeah. And I, I can't, uh, I'm afraid, tell you quite how long you'll be detained uh, after that. Again, it, it depends on the number of questions and the, the uh, length of time it takes to answer them. Thank you. 10 to 4, not before 10 to 4.